Hello, physics students. I am Mr. Williams, and what we're looking at here is an earthquake map. And so you can see on this earthquake map, well, obviously, it's the Earth, but you see some fault lines, and you see these concentric circles, a circle within a circle. Well, these are the earthquakes that have happened in the last seven days. If you look over to the right at the bar, you can see that um, in the last seven days, there's been 90 earthquakes on Earth. And um, the largest one was a 6.1, and the smallest one was a 4.5. So a pretty cool thing to look at. And you're going to notice that there is a pattern of these earthquakes. Um, these earthquakes are happening in the same place, the same locations. Looks like Africa's pretty quiet, and so is Europe. We've got a little earthquake up here along the mid-atlantic ridge the uh, northern part of it and you can see that uh, earthquakes happen primarily in the west of the americas so all along the edge of the coastline pretty interesting thing let's let it rotate and so we're going to see a high concentration of earthquakes along what is called the ring of fire the ring of fire is a place where lots of volcanoes exist and there's a lot of faults there and you can see that these faults are very active. They are just shaken and a shaken. Um, you can do all kinds of things with this. You could, uh, you know, put little flags on how intense these earthquakes are, like yeah, five point three over here, and um, there, there's things you could do. And you can even see inside of the Earth. Right, this is what it would look like from the inside. And anywho. Let's go on and start our lesson for today. So um, that was earthquake3d.com. So we're going to start off with a little bit of vocabulary. So this first vocabulary word is a fault, okay? A fault is a crack along the earth which movement has taken place. And you can see some of these faults from a um, aerial photograph, from satellites, from an airplane. There are some faults that are so obvious that you could stand in front of them and say, wow, that is a fault. Not all faults are as drastic and visible as this, but what you need to know, it's a crack along the earth, which movement has taken place. And then we're going to talk about elastic rebound. Elastic rebound is, is a type of movement from um, from from a fault. And it's the sudden release of energy that has resulted from fault movement. So we've talked about um, elastic potential energy, stretching of a rubber band. What happens when you let go after you stretch it out? It snaps back to its original form. And so in this animated GIF down here, you can see that in the beginning, wait for it to reset. Okay, in the beginning, um, there's pressure um, causing them to shear side to side, and then it all of a sudden snaps, and then there's that movement. So that would be the elastic rebound. This will be a sudden release of energy. Next, the focus is going to be the point of origin of an earthquake from within the earth. The focus is where the earthquake starts. It is not at the top, at the surface of the earth. It comes from within the earth. So that's an important thing to think about. And the epicenter is the point on the earth's surface that is directly above the focus of the earthquake. So in this animation that we had down here, the focus is in the center, but as it comes up, the first place that feels that earthquake at the surface is going to be the epicenter. Fracture is a crack in the earth that is not the result of the movement. So here you see a portion of the mid-Atlantic ridge. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge is this giant crack that goes along the Atlantic Ocean. It's not only the Atlantic Ocean, it connects the Earth in multiple places. Um, and so there is some uh, movement where the um, Mid-Atlantic Ridge is slowly spreading apart through a process we call seafloor spreading. Um, it happens about a centimeter a year um, currently. But um, what we need to see here is 
that we had these horizontal lines. These were through um, just fractures of the earth. They were not because of earthquake movement. There, there's not movement of that. Um, there's not movement of the earth in these directions. Uh, the movement would be primarily along this fault line, and the fractures are just where the stress has caused it to crack. And so um, since we're just talking about the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, um, if you look at Google Earth, amazing, amazing technology. This is the ridge we're talking about. And you see this crack going all the way down the earth. Let's zoom in a little bit more. All right. There is this crack that goes all the way down the earth. All right. It comes around here. Comes around here. And we can see along this ridge there are lots of fractures that are going horizontally on the screen right now. But um, these ridges, they they go all around the earth. There's a lot of seismic activity on these ridges. Let's orient north. Okay. And this ridge even goes up and through the continents here. And um, there's a lot of uh, activity along the Ring of Fire. You can see it comes up under um, Australia. And yeah, okay. Let's get out of here. Um, Google Earth, a lot of fun stuff. You can learn a lot just by exploring Google Earth. But that is the Mid Atlantic Ridge, and you can see some evidences of fractures here. So let's move on. Fracture, a crack in the earth that is not the result of movement. Okay, so um, earthquakes do not happen in random location. They occur at the edge of tectonic plates. Um, tectonic plates are also called lithospheric plates. Th this is where they occur. They occur at these tectonic plates, this movement of, this, of the um, surface of the earth. Okay, and we have a um, image right here that labels the plates. Um, you can see this plate that looks a lot like Africa and um, part of Europe. Um, we have the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Okay, that was part of that plate, the South Indian Ridge. Um, these aren't the name of the plates I misspoke, but these are different ridge lines. But this is where a lot of the movement is taking place. You can see in California, Right, there's a lot of um, movement taking place here along the western coast of South America. And if you remember where we have seen the, the uh, earthquakes, this spot right here is where the earthquakes are happening, okay, along these ridges. So earthquake is any seismic vibration of the earth caused by the rapid release of energy. Earthquakes are sudden, they're unpredictable, and can result in major destruction. In fact, the last time we had a major earthquake in Kentucky, um, it was so powerful, it caused the Mississippi River to run backwards. And we're overdue for an earthquake like that, so they say. Earth's crust is rigid, rocky material that will suddenly break when under stress. Stress is the force per unit area that acts on the material. So um, that's kind of the definition of stress. It's how much force per unit area. So like um, how many pounds per square inch, right? Or how many newtons per centimeter? That's what stress is. And um, Earth, it's rigid and rocking. It breaks and cracks and crumbles when under stress. And so now the crust, the first layer of the Earth, there are different there are different types of stress, okay? You need to know each type of uh, this stress because these will be on your quiz, so make sure you know. Okay, the first one is compressive stress. Mass is shortened by squeezing, right? Compression, you just push it together. Uh, compressional stress is like this image in the top right. Tension stress, mass is being lengthened by stretching, okay? So just think about you and a friend. Maybe you had an argument and there's some tension between you two. Does that mean you're closer? No, that usually, if you have tension between someone, you're usually further apart. And that is what tension stress is. 
Okay, they, they take something and they lengthen it, they stretch it out. The next type of stress is called shear stress. Okay, think about scissors, right? Um, when you have scissors, you have the shears, right? That's another name for scissors. Each one of the blades, they, they move in opposite directions along the same area, right? The plane, the sharp edge. So shear stress is different parts of a mass are moved in opposite directions along a plane. And that is representative right here in the shear stress. Torsion stress, think about your torso, right? Your torso is your stomach and your chest and your upper body, right? Um, what what does your tor what is your torso able to do? It's able to twist. It's able to move. And that's what torsion, excuse me, torsion stress is. Mass is twisted. And um, if you have that in the earth, this is the kind of this is the kind of uh, movement you would be experiencing. Remember those, you will be quizzed on at least two of those. And uh, the types of deformation, very important to know as well. Elastic deformation occurs when a material deforms as stress is applied, but snaps back into shape when stress is removed. We saw that in the animated GIF, okay? Um, elastic deformation, you, you can almost think of a, um, of a diving board, right? Very elastic, but um, usually when elastic deformation occurs, usually there is a net movement that happens. But in general, something's getting really bent and stressed, but it snaps back into shape when the stress is removed. Plastic deformation occurs when rocks change shape when bent under stress. This is difficult to do. Rocks aren't very bendy. I don't know if you've noticed that. But um, when you go deeper at depths below the earth, rocks become very hot. And when rocks are hot, they are much more bendable, like clay. So if you can think about iron, which is kind of technically a rock, it's just very, very pure substance, right? Um, iron is bendable. And once you heat it up and you get it red hot, then you can move it. But uh, that requires extreme temperatures. We're talking about lava temperatures. So rocks are able to bend when hot, but break when they're cool. This is similar to a wax candle snapping when cold, but bendable when warm. So if you have a candle um, and it's cold, it's going gonna, it's gonna to snap very easily, right? Um, when it's warm, you can get a little bit of bendy action out of it. So strain energy builds up along cracks in the Earth's crust. When strain energy is released, it causes the rock to move to a new position, right? You, you just you put energy into it, and then it gets to a point where it's enough energy to cause movement, right? and that's what happens. And a crack in the Earth where the movement has taken place is called a fault, okay? If there is no movement, the crack is called a fracture, okay? Make sure you know those important vocabulary words to understand. And when you have this sudden release of energy at the fall, it's known as elastic rebound. The elastic rebound causes seismic vibrations known as earthquakes. So elastic rebound, this sudden release of energy, right, where energy is building up, building up, building up, and then it just psh, it snaps into place. Um, that is called elastic rebound, rebound, and that's what we get earthquakes from. Okay, so there are types of earthquake waves, right? The point where earthquake waves travel in all directions is called the focus. We talked about that during the vocabulary. Focus is deep below the earth. That's where it originates. The point on the earth's surface directly above the focus is the epicenter. That's where we feel the earthquakes, okay? Um, as, the word, as the earthquake um, permeates the earth, it goes in all directions, down, up, to the sides. Um, but eventually it's going to hit the surface and the point where it hits the surface first is the epicenter and that's the point where it's going to be the strongest it's going to be felt the strongest earthquake waves travel in all directions just like i said and much like ripples in water um, when a stone is thrown in but we're thinking three-dimensional right it's not really a circle it's more like a sphere right i'm traveling out in all directions okay so um 
There are two types of wave. We have compressional waves, P waves, sometimes called uh, longitudinal waves. They have different terms um, based upon how you're using them. Um, and so basically, if we have a, a slinky, if I just push the slinky forward, um, you are going to see a compression of the slinky and it's going to move down, right? So this is time one, two, three, four, five. So this is supposed to be um, uh, a pictorial image of an animation, right? Um, and so as you can see, this compression moves forward. They call it dilation, where we have this rarefaction where when you when you compress one part, it's going to stretch out the other part of the earth. Okay. Um, so body waves are waves that travel through the material through the materials like rocks or water. One type of wave is a primary wave, also called the P wave. These types of waves cause a push and pull motion. The energy travels very quickly and they do not cause a permanent change of location of materials. P waves can travel through all types of matter such as solids and liquids. A couple of uh, ways to remember what a P wave is. Okay, P waves are primary waves. They're sometimes called longitudinal waves. But P waves are primary waves. Well, if something is primary, it happens first. Okay, and so um, these are the first earthquake waves that we will experience because they travel the fastest, okay? So if you experience something first, you can call it the primary. Also, it is a push and pull motion, right? There's gonna be compression, right? So you're gonna have that compressive stress, and then you're gonna have that tension stress as um, that compression is relieved. If you squeeze one part together, another part's gonna be stretched. And so after this kind of earthquake wave travels through, um, like, uh, the stuff on the surface of the earth is primarily going to be kept in the same place. So P waves happen in solids and liquids. Um, they also happen in um, gases as well because sound is a P wave. Okay, so S wave, um, sometimes called a shear wave, sometimes it's called a longitudinal wave, sometimes it's called a secondary wave. And this would be like taking a slinky and moving it side to side or taking a rope and throwing, the, uh, throwing one end of the rope up and just watching it travel down. And um, as time goes on, you will see this um, transfer of energy go down the wave. Um, when you see this, one thing to keep in mind, this is not... Um, for the most part, matter does not get moved in this wave. Energy is just going down, shaking. Some things on the surface of the earth might be knocked over, toppled, crushed, or whatever else, but um, the earth isn't um, permanently moving for the most part, except for at fault lines. Okay, body waves, these are the secondary waves that we just saw on that image. They travel more slowly, secondary, happens second, so it's slower, and sometimes they're called shear waves. These kind of waves cause particles to move perpendicular to the direction of travel. So if the energy is going forward, the, um, the material is going side to side, right? So if you had that slinky, the energy was going forward, but the, what, uh, the energy is going forward, the slinky was going side to side before it went to its original location. S, ray, S waves arrive after the P waves and they can only travel through solid material. They cannot travel through water. And it's uh, kind of difficult to see because we think of um, water waves having crests and troughs and they look so S wave like, but um, that has to do a little bit with the um, geometry of the earth underneath. And uh, yeah. Oops. Um, so surface waves move in a complex manner, much like ocean waves. Motion can be can occur as up and down, side to side, or parallel movement. And we're going to see an illustration of this next. All right. And so um, up here, this is that slinky test. This comes out of our textbook. Um, if your slinky's here originally and then you push, you're gonna see this compression move down the uh, 
uh, slinky wire. And so this would be in this image of an earthquake, back and forth motion, uh, produce P waves, travel on the surface and cause the ground to buckle and fracture. So we got a buckle here, we got a fracture here. Now, if you have S waves, um, you shake the rope and it's, the motion is going to go, the energy is going to go forward. That's the direction of the wave, and the particles are going to go side to side. And so, um, right, this could either happen up and down or side to side. If it was up and down, um, you know, you'll have these up and down motions of the earth. Um, a surface wave could also go side to side. And so if it's going to side to side, you can see how at least on this road that um, some of it went to the right, some of it went to the left. And, uh, and then, uh, yeah, sometimes these waves can even be circular and it can be more complex. So it, it's pretty complex. It's not so simple as just only P waves and S waves and, you know, um, waves can bounce back and as waves reverberate underneath the earth and bounce back, you do have a combination of forces. So it, it can get complex. But guys, that is what we need to know about earthquakes. Um, make sure that you um, understand those vocabulary words. Make sure you understand the process. And guys, have a nice day.